So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, our second guest speaker is Dr. Augustine Zongon, uh, with the lecture entitled "The Novel Domestication of Wild Species: A Platform to Create More Species and Resilient Crops." Dr. Zongon is a geneticist and holds a master's degree in plant physiology and biochemistry from the University of São Paulo. In 2011, he received a PhD in plant biology from the Australian National University and subsequently conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Sydney and the University of Sao Paulo. He has been tenured as assistant professor of molecular plant physiology at Federal University of Minnesota since 2015. Uh, his main research interest is the genetic and functional analysis of the domestication and breeding traits in Solanaceae. Uh, his work is funded by the Royal Society UK Research and Innovation and the Alexander Von Humboldt Foundation. Uh, Dr. Zengen, you may start your screen share. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this IMPD. Uh, please, everyone, uh, feel free to ask questions in section Q&A right below the video, and we'll forward the most voted ones to the speaker at the end of the presentation. So, Dr. Zagan, can you hear me? Each one. Okay, yep. Hello. You can you may start your screen share first. So and I'm sharing my screen now. And if you want to I'm gonna show you. So yeah, are you going to turn the camera on or yeah, it's it's here. Uh, we don't see your camera. Yeah, okay, that's good. No problem. So let me see if I can turn on my camera. Just a second. Um, Okay, now I don't see anything. Okay, here I am. My audio. Start the video. Okay, um, so this, I cannot start the video because the host has stopped it. So I think you need to, you need to activate my camera. Okay, there I am. Can you see me now? Yep, now I can see you. And this, uh, so I'm projecting from projecting from from my second screen. Is everyone seeing that? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Your presentation is on the screen. Okay, so I think we still have a couple of minutes until two o'clock. Um, I don't want to start too early. So what I'm going to do first is um, thank Jason for the introduction. Uh, thank everyone Jiven, for, <clears throat> for the organization of the of the event uh, and thanks for the invitation uh, of course this would be more fun if we could do it um, in person but uh, as I was telling Jason before at least we can feel we can feel good that our carbon footprint is not so huge with um, less international travel. Um, in any case, I hope the um, situation goes back to normal eventually and um, we can have these events uh, in person again because it's a lot more fun. So um, what I have here for you today is a bit of a conceptual presentation. It's a very general overview of a platform that we have proposed and we have been working on it's a data heavy presentation it's mostly uh, a few ideas put together and um, i think well i hope it will be um, uh, synergistic to some of the other presentations which i have seen 
uh, the titles from and the, and the speakers, I think, are, are a, a really great lineup. So if we put everything together, hopefully it will be something coherent. Okay, so um, it's almost two o'clock. I think I can get started now. Should we kick it off? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, now it's two o'clock. So thanks again for the for the invitation and thanks to everyone who's watching, uh, whatever you are in the world. Uh, so the title of my talk is De Novo Domestication of uh, Wild Species, a platform to create more nutritious and resilient crops. I'll just switch to the laser pointer. So, um, one of the, the challenges for agriculture in the coming decades is that the, changing, cli the changing, changing climate will create more adverse environments and lead to losses in productivity for major crops. So here's a, a nice plot from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, showing the proportion of losses in a for major crops in the US over the five years between 2012 and 2017. And as you can see, a large part of the losses is related to extreme weather events like drought and flooding, whereas pathogens uh, contribute a smaller portion, but that also has its cost. And it is uh, lots of breeding behind this also lots of agrochemical use, which is not desirable in the face of uh, sustainable intensification. Another challenge is that uh, growing CO2 in the atmosphere has been shown or is predicted to lead to a reduction in nutritional value for many crops. This is a summary of two uh, meta-analyses from many crops grown on average in 541 ppm CO2 compared to ambient CO2, 400 uh, ppm, which is roughly what we have today, growing a bit higher now. And what we see is um, reduction, uh, I think the legend is missing here, but this is basically phosphor, um, these nutrients are um, iron, zinc, and magnesium. So if you, you can see, uh, no, sorry, and protein. So iron, zinc, and protein. So protein is the, is the small uh, symbol in the bottom. So you, you can see it's a reduction whenever you grow uh, the, the crops in high CO2 due to a dilution effect. So the nutrients are diluted because of an increased uh, amount of carbon in these um, crops. So it's both together, the abiotic stresses that I mentioned before and the uh, nutritional penalty produced by increased CO2 are challenges for breeders over the next few decades. And they, they require the development of more resilient and nutritious crops. One of the problems to achieve um, more resilient and nutritious crops is the bottlenecks that occur during crop domestication. So domesticated plant species lost much of their original genetic diversity and the potential for improvement um, via uh, human selection. So what, what happened is that uh, they generally show a significant uh, reduction in genetic diversity compared to their wild progenitors due to um, a massive reduction in population size during the original domestication events, which is called the domestication bottleneck. And it was followed by an expansion in population size. So what happens is that this constriction in population size, um, which in some crops was more severe than in others, led to a rapid loss of heterozygosity um, uh, through the increased uh, strength of drift. So genetic drift when population size is small is gets stronger. 
and it's uh, and this uh, increased genetic uh, drift masks the effect of selection over um, over a period of time. So uh, uh, all of these factors plus the reduction in population size, which led to genetic erosion and has caused an increasing mutational load. So the amount of deleterious mutations in, in domesticated crops has increased. All of this constrain our ability to breed more resilient and nutritious crops, given the material that we are studying uh, with. So early on, what was proposed by some agronomists, including Nikolai Vavilov, was the use of white crosses of crops to their wild relatives, so that we could recover and we could increase the amount of genetic variation uh, available in breeding programs. Uh, Vavilov was the first to, to recognize and advocate the use of um, wild species, uh, in this case for cereal breeding. And by the 1960s and 1970s, white crosses had um, already been successful in incorporating uh, genes, uh, mostly for uh, biotic uh, stress tolerance, as you can see here in this list. So every cross indicates a wild relative, a different wild relative that was used uh, uh, in a white cross with, with the crop to incorporate uh, any of these traits. So as you can see, the majority of traits is related to, to best resistance, which is mostly monogenic traits. Uh, for instance, gene for gene resistance. And this can be incorporated in a relatively straightforward manner using uh, molecular markers and, and marker assisted uh, selection. So, what we have proposed to tackle the problem of reduced uh, genetic um, diversity available for breeding resilience and nutritional quality uh, is this uh, the novo domestication uh, platform which i've summarized here so basically the um, uh, uh, the crops that we want to uh, we want to breed have low resilience uh, and low nutritional value and what we can do is identify genes involved in domestication and breeding through these different uh, platforms and identify those genes, uh, so basically extrapolate those genes to the wild species and then edit those genes in the wild species, transform them, conduct uh, agronomic assessments and create new crops uh, through targeted manipulation of those domestication genes. So basically this pipeline has uh, four components and uh, what I will discuss in this presentation then is uh, how recent breakthroughs uh, such as the publication of uh, crop band genomes and some of the uh, new tools for gene editing uh, can contribute to uh, establish this pipeline uh, as a robust uh, platform to create uh, new crops. So the domestication syndrome is the suit of uh, the suite of traits uh, that differentiates a, a crop from its uh, wild relatives or wild ancestors. This is called so. Um, this, this was defined uh, as the domestication syndrome based on on the observations by Charles Darwin on domestic mammals. So he saw that uh, there were many traits that were always found together. And an analysis in, in crop plants has led to the same conclusion. So this is a summary between monocots and new dicots. And these traits that are listed here are usually found in domesticated um, species. The question is, what's the number of genes that need to be modified to convert a wild species into a crop? And this is unknown. It's a matter of a lot of debate in the literature. So it could be a few major genes or it could be thousands of uh, small effect quantitative um, loci. Uh, a large part of the, of the research effort in domestication uh, has been conducted on highly bred species and, and improved cultigenes like maize. 
uh, where, where massive polygenic variation has been described. Um, so so it's, it's lots of genes with small additive effect. And this may not be representative of the, the dynamics that's operating on the more than 2,500 uh, domesticated species that we have in the world today. Um, the, the expanding body of knowledge that we have suggests that a few traits controlled by major genes uh, selected over, short, over a short period of time could be, could be sufficient to bring about a domesticated form from a wild uh, species. For instance, this is another uh, meta-analysis that I like a lot, where they, uh, the authors analyzed 203 crop species and what they discovered is that on average, they had 2.8 uh, uh, domestication syndrome traits, uh, with 84% of them having between two and five traits. So it's basically traits that differentiate the crop from, from its wild ancestor. Um, some other um, observations that they, that they did is that, for instance, loss of shattering, which is a classic domestication trait in cereals, is only found in 16% of the crops that they analyzed, and uh, changes in metabolic profile, which is that one seen here, which is usually not something that we think of immediately when we think of domestication, except for a few species, it's like loss of toxicity or bitterness. It was actually found in 66% uh, uh, of all the analyzed uh, species. So this shows that there's a lot of variation and it's a, it's a huge spectrum of possibilities uh, to domesticate wild species via targeted genetic changes. Uh, this is, these are two examples that I particularly like, um, which is uh, a kiwi fruit and a cranberry. And then like for cereals, um, the time frame for the appearance of the appearance of the domestication syndrome traits in these species was very short. So kiwi fruits, the, the last 100 years and cranberry, uh, the last 200 years. So what we hypothesize is that um, the targeted manipulation of a small set of genes is sufficient to create uh, the most common features of the domestication syndrome uh, if you alter key aspects of the wildlands growth, development and, and nutritional quality. So recently, uh, with the advent of um, uh, long reach sequencing, uh, uh, there's new platforms that are quite uh, robust and efficient and more affordable, uh, have revealed the extent to which uh, domesticates have lost val valuable genetic uh, diversity. This year, an example in, uh, in soybeans, this is a very recent paper, showing that basically if you uh, sequence a large panel of wild and, and domesticated uh, uh, genotypes. What you find is 35% of the genes are shared between all accessions and 50% are not shared between all accessions. So that is called the uh, uh, dispensable genome. Uh, the really interesting observation behind this is that the dispensable genome is a bit of a misnomer because when you think about dispensable, we think of something that is superfluous and you can do away without or do, 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 or do with uh, without relying on it. And, um, and the truth is this, this, this genes, this dispensable genome is enriched in genes related exactly to abiotic and biotic stress, uh, uh, resistance and, and tolerance. So this is uh, a key component of what we could use for breeding today, and we don't have it available because a lot of the highly bred uh, cultivars have lost this chunk of the, um, the gene pool of the species. It's another example in, in tomato where they sequence 725 geographically and phylogenetically different accessions. And what they showed is that almost, almost 5,000 protein coding genes are not uh, present in cultivated tomato compared to, um, compared to the wild um, relatives. Uh, so again, these genes, maybe some of them were not assembled and, or annotated in the original reference genome, 
but the authors hypothesized that probably most of them were lost during domestication and improvement. And um, again, this dispensable set, what they showed is that it is enriched in, in um, biotic and abiotic. So there's an A missing here. Abiotic stress resistance genes. And um, similar results were found for, were described for uh, the potato. So potato, um, the wild ancestor, Solanum candolianum, um, contains 521, uh, 529 genes that are absent in the cultivated uh, tetraploid potatoes, uh, which are um, uh, uh, enriched, again, for uh, resistance to, uh, to, to um, pathogens, to frost, and to late blight. So, so again, this is material that would be very useful for breeding, and we don't have it available. So what the novel domestication proposes is that you could um, basically recover this lost diversity if uh, instead of doing white crosses to, to the domesticates, um, we retrieve the information about domestication and the information about the genes that are involved in the uh, uh, improvement of crops. And we operate those changes in through gene editing to domesticate the wild species and harbor their, uh, or harness, I'm sorry, harness their um, abiotic uh, resistance traits and, and nutritional quality uh, traits. So, so the novel domestication uh, could be valuable for crop improvement in the phase of climate change, in the phase of um, increased uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and potentially decreasing nutritional value. And it could also correct the excessive focus on, on yield uh, improvement, which has um, uh, basically uh, um, eroded the genetic basis of many of our crops. So let me briefly address the prospect of um, domesticating a few uh, of the major uh, Solanaceae crops. So I will talk about tomatoes, potatoes, and peppers. The tomato, as you know, is originally from South America and is closely related to 13 wild species, which, is, which are listed here. And um, as you can see from the geographic range of distribution, we go from the uh, Atacama Desert in northern Chile to the uh, coastal regions of Peru, all the way up to the uh, High Andes, uh, maybe three, three, three thousand, three and a half thousand uh, meters above sea level, to the uh, borders of the Amazon. Uh, Amazon forest, Amazon jungle in uh, Ecuador and northern Peru. So that gives uh, an ideal selection pressure for lots of abiotic and abiotic stress resistance traits to evolve in these wild relatives. So for instance, uh, Solanum galapagensi, which is an endemic species of the Galapagos Islands, is um, interesting because it has very small fruit, they're the size of a pea, but they are edible, uh, they're not toxic, and they have a high content of uh, beta carotene, which is the um, precursor of vitamin A. Uh, they are high in sugars and high in organic acids, so that's, um, that, that means a high bricks, which is a very valuable agronomic trait. And it's also um, a resistant uh, a species that is resistant to insects due to the accumulation of uh, acyl sugars in the leaves. So it's also a very valuable trait for tomato production because um, insect pests are very costly to, um, to avoid by using uh, uh, um, heavy spraying with um, agrochemicals. And likewise, we have uh, Solanum habrochitis, which is one of the um, endemic species of the high mountains, so it's resistance, resistant to frost, uh, which uh, tomato is very sensitive to. And Solanum vanellia is um, found in these uh, desert regions. 
of um, uh, southern Peru and is resistant uh, to drought. Uh, as for um, uh, potato, uh, it's also uh, native of uh, South America and it is um, related to uh, more than 200 accessions uh, between wild species and um, cultivars or wild cultivars of, of potato, and some of which have the advantage of uh, being, dip being deployed, which is um, a really good platform to uh, do conventional and molecular breeding uh, compared to, to, to the potato, which is a tet tetraploid and, and the generation, as you know, of the new uh, potato cultivar can take many decades. In fact, um, some of the most uh, grown potatoes in the US and the UK are now more than 70 or 80 years old. So they have been released in the 1920s and 30s. So transforming the potato to a deployed crop would also be uh, very advantageous to, uh, to the, uh, with uh, the, the novel domestication uh, platform. So here an example is some of the, oh, sorry, some of the deployed uh, varieties of um, Solanum fureca, fureja, which is called fureca. This is has been bred and is grown in the, in the Netherlands, particularly. And so you have all of this variation. And this is uh, a, a diploid species that has um, very good flavor in the, in the, in the tubers. Uh, they have a high amounts of uh, vitamin C and they are very resistant to, uh, to disease. So this would be a, a suitable candidate for uh, improvement using genetic. And uh, lastly, capsicum, so it's um, um, the peppers, the chili peppers, uh, which are also of uh, tropical origin, but, but breeding has been carried out mostly in temperate countries. So, so there's a very strong founder effect in, in capsicum associated with that um, uh, intercontinental migration. Uh, so that the, the bottleneck, the genetic bottleneck in, in capsicum is particularly uh, strong. So apart from the variation that is very obvious in, in um, fruit color, fruit shape and size, the underlying genetics between all of the uh, capsicum crops is very similar. So here's an updated uh, phylogenetic tree where uh, four new species have been included um, a couple of years ago. So there's around 30 species out of which five have been domesticated. And the problem is you have all this uh, variation available. It's very rich and they, um, uh, they are found in um, um, lots of very contrasting regions from the, um, um, basically the, the Andes in Bolivia to the Amazon basin in the, in the jungle. But um, this is very difficult to take advantage of because of um, severe incompatibility barriers between the wild species and the domesticates. Uh, so, as I said before, here it's the same thing. Some of these wild relatives have very interesting resilient traits, such as, uh, for instance, this one here, uh, Capsicum chacoense, which is endemic from, from the uh, southern Bolivia, Paraguay, and northern Argentina region is uh, tolerant to drought. It is highly pungent. The fruits are edible. They are not toxic. And as you can see, it's very productive. The problem is the fruits are very small and there's lots of them. So um, this is very difficult to harvest, although people sometimes grow it uh, or just harvest them in the wild. So this, is, this is a wild species that is uh, uh, semi-domesticated. It's, it, it's, it's used uh, in, in some of the regions where it grows in its wild form. It could be quickly improved um, using our platform. So what would be the ideal traits to engineer if you want to transform a wild species into a crop? Well, there's quite a few of them, but um, I've selected three that I think would be the most relevant uh, as a first step. So, and in terms of uh, the genetic basis, 
we have already sufficient knowledge to know exactly what genes to target and what modifications need to be carried out to obtain the desired phenotypic outcome. So let me just see. So I just want to know if everything's fine. Mm. Yeah, looks good. Okay. No, because I'm seeing some messages, incoming messages, and I'm I'm afraid that you know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, it's fine. Okay. 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 Sure. Great. So yeah, just just in case I was just talking and no one was listening or something. So as I said, the um, three main traits that we believe could contribute to as a first step to, to domesticate the wild species are um, the changing growth habit, photoperiodic response, and the reduction of toxicity. So manipulation of growth habit helps to adjust the crop to specific agronomic uh, management systems, for instance, in the field or in the glass house. And uh, while relatives of crops uh, show mostly uh, indeterminate growth, so what happens is uh, they have reduced apical dominance, they're very branched, and eventually they start growing out of control and they fall over and they have this uh, prostrate uh, growth habit that is not um, useful in an agronomic um, setting. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things in terms of the genetic basis of growth habit is that it is consistently regulated by the same gene family, which is called sets. So this family is highly conserved between crops. And this is a very interesting example of convergence or uh, evolutionary convergence in crop domestication because uh, these same orthologs have been selected in all of these uh, species that I'm showing here and, and, and a few more actually. Um, I didn't include PGMP and, and a few other uh, cereals. So basically all of these are orthologs of uh, terminal flower one from Arabidopsis and all of them carry mutations in the uh, crops that convert them from determinate to a determinate um, growth plan. So this is this is a, a key family. This is a, the genetic tree of all uh, many different species of angiosperms. So as you see, it's quite conserved. And it's a key family because it also controls uh, um, very relevant traits to uh, domestication, like seed germination, flowering time, and tuberization in the case of um, the, the potato. And in many, in many cases, they have um, pleiotropic effects in um, uh, plant architecture, like here, for instance. So in tomato, you have your indeterminate growth um, wild type, if it could be a wild species, or also a, um, a, a glasshouse uh, tomato for fresh tomato production. So it usually grows unrestricted, and, uh, and you have to prune it. This, the, this is the origin of the name of the gene, so self-pruning basically terminates the apical meristem in two uh, consecutive inflorescences, and you have these very valuable pleiotropic changes in the plant, which are shortened uh, internodes and simultaneous fruit ripening, which allow mechanical harvesting of the of the tomato. So what has been done recently uh, is to show that if you create random mutations using CRISPR-Cas9 in the promoter region, in the cis regulatory region of, uh, uh, of the self-pruning gene in tomato, you can find, or you can produce plants with altered levels of SP uh, expression, which fine tune growth habit and lead to increased yield. So at the moment, we still don't know, we don't have a very good understanding of uh, cis regulatory regions in, in plants, but uh, new tools using deep learning and machine learning 
are beginning to introduce uh, or to create more knowledge about um, uh, sequence signatures found in promoters and in enhancers. And this will eventually allow more targeted and, and uh, knowledge-based um, manipulation to be conducted in, in the future. This is instead of uh, just um, a random uh, uh, approach as it was done here. So the second uh, trait I was um, mentioning was the photoperiodic response. So in the case of, uh, for instance, tomatoes, what you can see here is if you have your wild relatives, Salam um, the plants tend to flower in short days, they take longer to flower in long days. So the duration of the photoperiod is key to control the life cycle of the plant. And this of course has uh, agronomic impact. The domesticated tomato is, um, is still a bit responsive. So it's not completely day neutral. It's still, I would say a short day plant, but the impact of the um, uh, photoperiod length difference is smaller than for wild uh, species. Now, if you introduce through crosses, this is a small infrogression line with um, that harbors 31 or 32 genes from Solanum vanelliae, you find that it uh, reproduces the um, photoperiodic response of the wild species. And the, what, what this allowed was the cloning of the gene that was responsible for this photoperiodic um, response. So again, using um, CRISPR mutagenesis, uh, the, uh, the wild type, compared to the wild type, now the CRISPR mutant has a much smaller response, response to day length. Uh, and, and again, this is another paralogue of this bee, which is a member of the SETS family that I was talking about uh, before. Uh, why is this uh, important and why, why is this relevant? Well, this is related to the latitudinal spread of domesticates from their centers of origin. So if uh, over the course of domestication and the um, spread of crops from their original centers of origin, which I try to overimpose here with this other map, so you can see it's mostly tropical and subtropical centers of origin, but they are, a lot of these crops are also grown today in very high latitudes, mostly in the Northern hemisphere, right? There's not much here. So what was selected for was variation in genes of the photoperiodic pathway and of the circadian clock. And this has been shown in soybean, in barley, and in, in rice, for instance, and also in genes of the sets family in the uh, tomato and in, in potato. And potato is a particularly important crop in terms of photoperiodic response because the, the wild potatoes, originally from the Andes, which are basically here, uh, it's a tropical crop of high altitude, but still tropical. Um, they tuberize in short days. Uh, so the short days in the Andes coincide with the start of uh, winter. So when you grow them in the tropical center, center of origin, this is not a problem because winters tend to be mild uh, because you're in the tropics. But when potatoes were introduced in Europe, um, what happened is you needed to introduce mutations to allow tuberization in long days so that cultivation could be um, could happen in the in the spring or the summer of the northern hemisphere and what was found is that uh, this gene here has mutations that um, allow it to go and regulate it and not repress constants which is um, a circadian clock gene and constants is not repressed so it doesn't induce SP5G, and SP5G does not re, re, uh, repress the tuberogenic uh, factor SP6A. So when this factor is upregulated, it induces tuberization. So if this, this very simple um, genetic uh, mechanism or genetic circuit, and as you can see again, two of the genes belong to the sex family that I was talking about before. So similar modifications, uh, this is a relatively old paper now. Um, this was um, done just using overexpression lines, not uh, um, gene editing. So similar modifications targeted to any of those genes could 
uh, be introduced in, in short day uh, diploid potatoes, for instance, that I was talking about before, uh, to allow them to, to grow and tuberize in the northern hemisphere. And lastly, I want you to uh, mention a few uh, recent discoveries about the reduction of toxicity in, in crops. So this is uh, an analysis done again in a, in a large panel of wild, so here you have three rows, basically Pimpinelli following is the wild tomato. So as the form is the cherry tomatoes, which are considered an intermediate or semi-domesticate form. And this big uh, tomato cultivars are the highly improved elite varieties. And the intensity of the color is uh, in this panel, um, basically refers to one glycoalkaloid in each uh, column. Basically, each number corresponds to a different chemical species of glycoalkaloid. And what you see is a progressive reduction over the course of domestication. And again, this looks, if you just looked at this, this looks very complex. And um, you would imagine there's a lot of quantitative variation behind it. But surprisingly, when they analyzed uh, the uh, transcriptome of all these uh, accessions, what they found is that most of the variation can be explained by just changes in these five genes. So one of the genes, I think it was this one here, uh, alters simultaneously the uh, concentration of eight uh, different species of uh, glycoalkaloids. So probably mostly transcription factors or master regulators, and when you knock them out, you can basically generate a large effect downstream, and it's relatively genetic uh, relatively simple genetic changes that are involved in this uh, trait. So recently CRISPR-Cas9 was used uh, to um, do a similar proof of concept in potatoes. It was in hairy roots, it's actually not in, in, in tubers, but what the authors did was they measured the levels of um, two of the main glycoalkaloids in, in potatoes, which are shaconin and solanin, and when they knocked out a um, uh, steroid um, uh, hydroxylase, it's called um, ST16DOX, uh, which is um, required for the biosynthesis. This is, this is uh, uh, a key enzyme in the pathway for, for, uh, for this glycoalkaloid. When you knock it out, basically what you have is uh, undetectable um, uh, quantities uh, in some of the events. So this is another excellent demonstration of very simple genetic change that can produce a very valuable uh, agronomic or phenotypic outcome. And lastly, and I particularly like this example, although it's not in the Solanaceae, this is in um, the uh, cucumber family, cucurbits. So you have the cucumber, melon, and watermelon. What the authors did was they took these uh, modules, uh, basically genetic modules of um, uh, um, master regulators or transcription factors uh, and um, and um, uh, enzymes. So basically enzymes involved in the biosynthesis of, of, of um, the bitter compounds in, in cucurbits, which are uh, present in the wild ancestors of all these uh, of all these crops. And what they found was that when you compare the wild, uh, uh, the profiles in the wild um, ancestors, what you had is a, a relatively high content of cucurbitacins, so this is tri tri triterpenoids. So these triterpenoids are the bitter, the compounds that give the bitterness to the, to the wild uh, relatives. And you usually found them in the fruit. So you see in the, in the bottom row, that's the fruit. And all the wild species have high amounts of cucurbitacins in the fruits. And then what they managed to do was associate that uh, high level to the um, specific uh, transcription factor behind it and compare it to the wild, um, sorry, to the domesticated species. And if it's just one, so one single uh, transcription factor called BT, which is um, basic uh, helix, loop helix transcription factor, what it does it is it, it binds in the, in the cis regulatory element of um, uh, Cucurbita thienol synthase, and it activates the transcription of uh, the gene that uh, synthesizes these uh, bitter compounds. So it's a simple mutation, a SNP, 
uh, in the transcription factor, uh, what it does is it impairs the production of um, uh, these triterpenoids in the fruit, but it does not impair the production, uh, uh, their production in the vegetative parts of the plant. So the leaves and the roots are still bitter, and this means they are still protected against insect attacks because they are these are um, very uh, powerful uh, defense compounds against uh, generalist uh, herbivores. So this very targeted change that was selected during domestication could be easily reproduced in, in other crops, probably transferred to other crops, where you could um, basically knock down the expression of a few transcription, transcription factors specifically in the fruit or in the tuber and still have uh, the insecticide or the protective compounds in the rest of the plant. So let me finish just by um, mentioning that we provided proof of concept for this idea in this uh, paper from, from a couple of years ago, uh, where what we did was we took the wild ancestor of uh, the tomato and we simultaneously edited six genes using uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And what we achieved was uh, improved um, uh, fruit size, uh, fruit number, uh, fruit shape, uh, nutritional content, by a lycopen uh, content and um, a change in, in plant architecture and growth habit uh, in only one generation and in a single transformation experiment. And, and the groups of uh, Kai Xiaogao and, and Zach Lipman in, in China and in the US also published uh, similar results in also Salano Pimpinellifolium and, and uh, Faisalis uh, respectively. So, so this approach uh, of um, knowledge-driven uh, domestication, uh, we think it's, it's, it's a good avenue to, to create new crops. Of course, um, there's um, regulatory barriers. The European Court of Justice ruled in um, 2018 that uh, organisms that were created using uh, um, genetic techniques uh, are subject to the same regulation uh, as GMOs which um, of course represents a, a serious uh, hard hurdle, uh, economic hurdle, uh, a barrier for the creation of genetic uh, crops. Um, but um, ever since that ruling in 2018, other countries like uh, the USA, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, and Japan, and Australia uh, have determined that they will not regulate uh, genetic crops as GMOs. So uh, if, they, if they, they do not contain uh, foreign DNA, of course. So this paves a way for, uh, for the, the novel domestication platform to be applicable to create um, uh, actual crops and put them on the field. And um, of course, in um, 2019, Calix, uh, the um, a biotechnology company in Minnesota released the Kalino uh, soybean oil, which is a high oleic acid oil with a longer shelf life and uh, the soybean cultivar that was um, used to create this oil was created using a genetic technology in the um, laboratory of uh, Dan Voitas, actually probably going to tell us about it in, in the next talk. So um, the point is uh, that um, genetic crops are already a reality in, in the field, uh, even though they're still regulatory and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, bureaucratic uh, uncertainties at multiple levels, uh, they can eventually gain, I think, uh, acceptance in society. And um, this uh, uh, tool that we are proposing here could inform, inform or be, be useful to, um, to introduce gene editing as a, as, as a new approach to, to create crops that are actually beneficial for the consumers as well as uh, the producers. So I think in terms of time, I'm almost getting there. So let me just wrap it up um, with some conclusion. So with um, the advent of genetic technology, uh, coupled with increased knowledge about the genetic basis of uh, domestication, uh, we can now create new crops with enhanced resilience uh, to, to environmental stresses and with increased nutritional quality. 
So we have previously proposed this, the novel domestication pipeline uh, as, um, and, and as a tool to do that and produce proof of concepts for engineering uh, six genes in a wild tomato species that resulted in a, in a new crop with um, increased uh, or improved agronomic traits. Uh, so these targeted genome modifications can help us uh, harness these resilience and nutrition traits that were lost during the domestication bottleneck. But of course, what we need is a deeper understanding of the genes that underlie the most important agronomic traits. And uh, lastly, uh, this new um, era of long read sequencing allows us to create pangenomes. And pangenomes are a way to support the novel domestication platform because they inform us, of, inform us of, of which valuable traits or valuable genetic uh, variants were lost during domestication. So couple this, coupling this with the new editing uh, genetic platforms like base editors and, um, and, and prime editing, we believe that uh, the novel domestication uh, pipeline could be, uh, hopefully, could, could soon be a reality. So let me just finish with a, with a nice quote that I recently found as rereading The Time Machine. It's an, it's an old classic. It's an oldie but a goodie. So H.G. Wells says, we improve our, our favorite plants and animals gradually because our ideals are vague and sensitive and our knowledge is very limited because nature too is shy and clumsy in our hands. Someday all this will be better, uh, better organized and better still. So this was more than a hundred years ago. So I think it's very prescient and it was quite a visionary. Uh, apparently, I think, and I hope we are getting there. So we are getting to the point where we can do uh, things more deliberately and using knowledge based approaches instead of uh, being just hit and miss with vague and sensitive uh, um, trial and error uh, approaches. So let me just uh, briefly mention my students. Some of them are ex-students, uh, but I keep this slide just to acknowledge. So uh, uh, Maria Antonia, Juliene, Gisenia, Jean, Emmanuel, Bruno, and Diego. These are my uh, students in my lab here in Visosa. My collaborators are uh, Lazaro, and Dan, who are both going to give talks here. So this is a nice coincidence. And Professor Alice Daferni, uh, the Max Planck Institute uh, for Molecular Plant Physiology in Gaul, in Germany, who I'm going to spend a year and a half uh, with as a visiting professor starting in November, hopefully. So um, I, I believe that we're going to be able to make some progress um, working there uh, as well in this in this platform. So just uh, to finish, I'll leave you some of my contact details so you can find me on Twitter, email. This is the web uh, page of our graduate program at um, Visosa. And this is the web page of my lab. If you want to you know, check it out, it's just went, uh, uh, went up uh, online a couple of uh, weeks ago or something, so it's still a work in progress, and I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm very, uh, very okay for time. So I'll leave it here, and I will be very happy to take questions if I can try to reply some. So thank you very much yeah. again. Yeah, thanks for your lecture, Doctor. Uh, we have a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Carla Spadini. Uh, she asks, you know, if it's is it possible to occur in compatibility between the wild species and the edited traits, uh, such as photosynthetic activity, primary and secondary metabolism, that do not support the modified trait? Um, sorry, uh, I just I'm trying to find the the cameras here. To okay, there I am. Can you um, repeat the question, Adriano, please? So she asks uh, if it's, is it possible to occur incompatibility between the wild species and the added traits, 
such as photosynthetic activity, primary and secondary metabolism that do not support a modified trait? That's, that's a good question. And um, it's a bit of an, an unknown. Uh, but we, what we know is that breeding did not change photosynthetic capacity at all. So that's one of the most um, uh, mysterious aspects of crop breeding. So we have plants that if you compare them side by side, they look like you know, huge tomatoes, huge spike of um, maize. But then when you compare the photosynthetic rate with the wild ancestors, they are the same. So I think it's mostly a question of source and sink relationships. So it's different allocations and different distributions of uh, carbon between tissues and organs. Um, I think, I hope not. I hope it won't, it won't cause any trouble. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, I have one more question from Elenido Santos. Uh, he says that he's a master's degree from Southern University of PLE. Uh, and he asks, uh, we know the power of CRISPR-Cas CRISPR -CRISPR system as a tool in gene editing. Uh, Dr. Zoma, in which way you see the potentialities of, of use this tool in the novel domestication? Well, um, that's a good question, actually because uh, a lot of what I've described here are relatively simple genetic changes. So it's basically targeted knockout, maybe uh, changes to the promoter. Uh, the problem is we now know uh, uh, over the last few years, uh, there has been a lot of work published uh, in describing the genetic basis of very uh, important agronomic traits. And quite a few of them are unique alleles. So unique alleles, that means it's just this one particular mutation and one particular event that produced the desirable agronomic outcome. So it's not just random mutagenesis or knocking out the gene. It's, for instance, uh, FW2.2 is a key um, fruit size regulator in tomato. And he has some unknown mutation in the promoter that leads to a change in the expression pattern. So the gene is not knocked out, it's just um, expression, it's expression in, it's, it's, it's higher at an earlier stage and it drops lower. So, so that's a very, very funny thing to gene expression, but it's very specific. So if you knock it out, this is what we did, it doesn't work. What you need is this particular expression profile. And to reproduce that, you need to use subtler tools than just knockout. So, so you need to use base editors to, to change one specific um, uh, nucleotide to create one particular SNP, or you need to use prime editing if, um, for instance, you want to recreate um, a, a, a transposon insertion. So, so sometimes you have a transposon insertion in the cis regulatory region, and what this transposon, transposon insertion does is it changes the expression pattern of the gene so you want to reproduce that. So what you can do is you need to do um, basically rewrite the promoter of the gene. And now you can do that using prime editing, which is a very, very new tool that was discovered by, um, or described by, by David Liu in Harvard. And now Kai Shagao has shown proof of concept that it can be used in plants as well. So, so this is early days. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the other speakers will talk more about the technical aspects of CRISPR, which are very interesting, but we just want to use the tools. And it's not, not particularly interesting, interested in how it works, but we are interested in what you can do with them. So what kind of changes can I do and what platform do I need to use? So that's, that's great. Okay, uh, I have one more. Uh, it's from Roberta. Uh, she congratulates you on your lecture, uh, mm -hmm. and she asks, uh, within your research with Aspinellifolium, uh, can you share with us what is the current stage of the research, next steps? Um, so basically, as I said, that's uh, a proof of concept. So we use Solanum pinfinellifolium, which is a wild relative, it is, it is the ancestor of tomato, but our idea was not really to create a new crop. A new crop. Uh, we just wanted to, to show that it can be done. So the next step is related to what I, what I was describing today. 
Um, I didn't go into details, but we are already working in uh, uh, wild relatives of capsicum and of potato. And in this case, we are interested in actually in creating a new crop. So something that can actually be grown on the field. So Solano bean penelifolium is not that interesting in that respect. Uh, you have lots of different accessions. So you have to choose one that's very suitable that has all these resistance genes and everything. Uh, we also used it because it's relatively easy to transform. The problem with a lot of these wild relatives is that they are very recalcitrant to transformation, very difficult to, uh, uh, to regenerate. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, um, that Dan Voitus is going to talk about this uh, because of just the, the title of his, of his talk, I think, suggests that he's going to talk about the difficulties in transforming um, uh, a lot of species, not only wild relatives, but also, actually some of the uh, cultivated, uh, domesticated uh, crops are very difficult to transform. Capsicum is one of them. Capsicum is particularly hard to, to work with in vitro, so it's to regenerate and to introduce DNA into. Um, so uh, basically, yes, answering the question, next steps with Pimpinelli folium, uh, none really. So that's uh, that work is done, it's completed. We are now interested in more promising material that we can actually transform into real actual crops. We still have some more time for questions. Uh, Calisto, uh, she's asking you uh, if biomass is direct, directly linked to reproductive success. Uh, with that in mind, uh, why reduced branching is not a disadvantage to... Um, so sorry, Adrian, was, that was a bit, a bit glitchy, so I didn't hear the whole question. If you can um, repeat it or paste it here on the... Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll repeat here. Uh, amount of biomass is directly linked to reproductive success. Uh, with that in mind, why reduce... Did you hear me? It's still it's still interrupted. So do you want to paste the question oh, in the you copy copy and paste it in the here in the, in the Okay, it's my internet. She's a little bit unstable right now. Sorry. I'll have to fit in your chat. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? I have it. Yeah, I found it. Yes, uh, the amount of biomass is directly linked to reproductive uh, success. With that in mind, why reduced branching is not a disadvantage to uh, domestication? Uh, well, I think there's quite a lot to unpack there physiologically. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, reduced branching is actually a very desirable trait for crops because side branching. Um, wastes a lot of uh, uh, photosynthate and photoaccumulates inside branches that are not as productive as uh, the main the main um, the main stem in the shoot. Um, yes, reproductive su success is also another term that we need to qualify because um, what we need to think here is reproductive success in nature is one thing, and then what we do in an agronomic setting is completely different. So in fact, when you say cultigen, today I said cultigen when I was talking about maize, we refer to, to crops that if they are grown in the wild, they will not survive anymore because they are so, so uh, deleterious. So the changes that we have made are so, are so deleterious that these plants in practice have no Darwinian fitness to survive uh, anymore. Uh, but they do very well when we grow them in monoculture and you know in a, in a clean field with uh, lots of herbicides and everything. So, um, so yeah, that's that's actually a very long discussion, but it's a very interesting um, question. So, basically, but in a nutshell, um, if you look at maize, which is the, the key example for uh, changes in in branching, it's very interesting. It's just, mostly one gene that's responsible for 40% of the variation between theosinte and maize. And uh, when you increase the expression of this transcription factor, you have this super 
you know, apical dominant plant, which is maize, with this big spike, instead of the stint, which is really branched with really small spikelets. But what has been shown that if you, if, you, if you harvest all of the little spikes and you put them together, the weight is exactly the same as in the big maize of domesticated maize. So basically, this is again a question of redistribution of um, carbon. So source and sink relationship changes. And actually, there's even more interesting work that has been done showing that if you grow theosinte in the conditions of 10,000 years ago, so with the uh, temperature and CO2 levels of 10,000 10, years ago, it's not as branched. It really looks more like a maze. So it is apically dominant. So there is some pressure in, in, in nature, sometimes in the wild, to select for more apical dominance. So there's, there's a lot of physiology behind it, but it's just, yeah, to, to keep it brief, that's what I'll say for now. That's, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask you our last question today. Uh, it's from Vitor, Vitor Faverato. Uh, the involvement of cell cycle genes in the regulation of tomato fruit size is well described. Do you think they could be combined with the edited genes TFs reported by your group? Um, yes, that's also a very good question. So we think it could, we think it should, we would love to. Actually, one of the genes that I mentioned today is a um, cell cycle regulator or cell, cell, cell size, which are sometimes closely linked. Uh, the question is, like I said before, these genes are probably more difficult to manipulate. So cell, cell cycle is a more essential thing. So you're going straight to the, under the hood, you know, in the, in the engine, you're going under the hood to the, to the very basic machinery of, 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 the, of the cell. And you need to affect really specific changes there probably, which are probably related to what I said, uh, heterochronic changes. So changes in timing of expression, and subtle changes in the degree of expression. They have to be very localized as well. So you want to change it only in the fruit, not in the whole plant. So that's why, that's why I think cell cycle regulators are very interesting targets, but we need to have more knowledge about how they work, about the, how the promoter sequences work and how they are um, expressed over time. And that, that's why it's, more diff it's easier to work with transcription factors, okay, it's just, you know, it's on or off. So the prescription factor is activating someone or it isn't. So this is, this is again, early days when we are doing what we can uh, with the knowledge that we have available. But, but that's a very good, that's a very good suite of genes uh, to work with uh, all these cell cycle regulators if, if we knew more about them and exactly what changes to make. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've reached our time limit now. I would like to thank you, Dr. Jungan, for participating in your event and for our qualifications. Uh, we still have a question, non answered. Uh, if you can, Dr. Jungan, you could answer it by typing it later uh, in the QA section. Uh, and that's it. And that's our first presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Our third guest speaker is Dr. Dan Voites, with the lecture entitled Overcoming Bottlenecks in the Editing Plant Genomes. Dr. Dan Voites is a professor in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology in De and Development, and the director of the Center for Precision Plant Genomics at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Voites graduated from Harvard College in 1984 and received his PhD from Harvard Medical School in 1990. He conducted postdoctoral research at Johns, Hop uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he was fellow of the Life Science Research Foundation. Prior to joining the University of Minnesota in 2008, 